be it on college campuses, on Capitol Hill with our government relations department, and in the courts with our Center for Law and Justice has not ceased. On the subject of tonight's topic, I want to applaud VOA in calling on the George Washington University to rescind its appointments of its interim dean and of the Elliott School of International Affairs, Ilana Feldman, exposing her bias against Israel, most notably that she led the academic boycott against Israel, which goes against everything that scholarly enterprise is supposed to be about. I am a graduate of GW and so proud to represent the organization calling on its leadership to do the right thing. Even during a pandemic, enemies of Israel and the Jewish people still exist. And so VOA's voice and work are crucial. We must ensure that we are strengthened and empowered. That is where you come in. Thank you to our current VOA donors. Your financial contributions help make this possible. But we have further to go and we have more that must be achieved. I encourage all of you to donate to VOA. It's requested that all of our attendees remain muted during the program. We will have a Q&A from the audience after the presentation. To submit a question, please click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen, which will allow you to type in a question. I will also give these instructions when we do the Q&A. It's an honor to have Dr. Richard Cravath with us tonight. Richard is one of those academics we wish there were more of, those who recognize the nature of anti-Semitism on campuses today and call it out. In fact, he wrote a book on it. Richard, Richard is the creator and founder, founding director of Boston University's program in publishing and digital media. He has taught more than 20 undergraduate and graduate courses in advertising, marketing, consumer behavior, and other areas that set several universities in Massachusetts and Florida. In addition, Dr. Cravath has had over 400 articles and book chapters published on topics of campus anti-Semitism, Israel in the Middle East, constitutional law and academic freedom. He lectures nationally on these topics and is a frequent guest on radio talk shows. Richard is the president emeritus and still serves on the board of Scholars for Peace in the Middle East. He is on the board of the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights and is a founding board member of the AMCHA Initiative. I'm also proud to say that Dr. Kravath is a member of our ZOA Florida board. And folks, please know this is just a brief summary of his accomplishments. And without further ado, I give you Richard, Dr. Richard Kravath. Thank you, Sharona, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to everybody today. Uh, Sharona is typical of some of the brave students that I come across when I'm invited to campuses to speak on this issue, because on American campuses and in Canada and in Europe, it takes no bravery at all to be a pro-Palestinian advocate but it takes enormous bravery and resolve to stand up for the Jewish state and to do so in a way that's articulate, meaningful, and compassionate. And Sharona typ typifies these students who have a dedication to Zionism and protecting Israel against its many foes and doing it in a way that's effective, articulate, and productive. So I'm very pleased to be working with her. And she has all of that energy that took me an additional 40 or 50 years to generate in my own career. Some of you are familiar with Melanie Phillips, the brilliant British columnist and author. And one of her recent books was called The World Upside Down. And I think it typifies in many ways the discussion that we're going to be having this evening because she describes the world being turned around so that the truth becomes lies and lies be are taken as the truth. And in Europe and in Britain specifically, she had witnessed the coming of Muslim refugees and Sharia law and the 
degrading of Western society and values. And she focuses also on the way that the world perceives Israel and how it has turned a Jewish state into a pariah among nations. And nowhere is this world turned upside down more prevalent than in the discussions on campuses between pro-Palestinian advocates and students who are pro-Zionist or pro-Israel or even pro-truth, because the truth is often distorted or completely lost in the discussion about Israel. So Mahmoud Abbas uh, says that not one Jew will live in the West Bank in the new Palestinian state when and if it's ever created, but accuses Israel of ethnic cleansing. And Gaza is portrayed by Israel's foes as the largest outdoor prison, and it's been under siege by Israel uh, since 2005, conveniently overlooking the fact that Israel, of course, disengaged in 2005, and Hamas immediately started sending missiles, mortars, and rockets into southern Israeli towns over the past 15 years, 15,000 rockets aimed at civilians to murder Jews, each one of those instances constituting a war crime. Yet Israel is depicted as the aggressive militaristic force. So tonight, because we have a limited amount of time and I wanted to give people an opportunity to ask questions on some of the points I'm going to make, I wanted to just introduce not the succession of endless uh, instances of campus anti-Semitism and activism against Israel and this world turned upside down, as Melanie Phillips called it, a dialogue of the demented, which takes place when Israel is being described on campuses. So I want to take a view from 30,000 feet so that we can see what are some of the common tropes What's the ideology that fuels this hatred of Israel, this campaign to demonize and delegitimize and destroy the Jewish state? Because as you know, in 1937, in 1947, in 1967, in 2000, and on several other occasions, the Palestinian Arabs have been offered a state of their own, even though they pretend that somehow Israel is in the way. And if only those nasty settlers in Judea and Samaria weren't there, everything would be peaceful in the entire Middle East, even the world. The fact is that it's clear that the Palestinians are not interested in statehood, even though that's what their proponents profess. The reality is that the creation of a new Palestinian state is not the issue. The issue is the existence of an autonomous, sovereign Jewish state. And it, it doesn't matter if that Jewish state is in the 1948 borders or the 1967 borders or the borders proposed most recently by Trump in his deal of the century plan, which included $60 billion of economic aid for the new Palestinian state an offer which was not even looked at or read by the Palestinians. So it's obvious that statehood isn't necessarily the issue, nor is it the issue of campus activists who are trying to unravel the legitimacy of Israel and degrade it and make it a pariah in, in the world community. So I'm going to show a few slides because, and we're going to watch a very short video to give a taste of some of the common tropes and some of the ideology which has been used repeatedly as a way of demeaning Israel, libeling it, accusing it of a being a, a colonial, apartheid, racist regime, that Israel is an illegitimate state, that after World War II, white Europeans suddenly showed up in this fictitious, fictitious 
nation called Palestine and evicted the Arab residents, the indigenous Arab residents, and created a Jewish state, which they had no right to do. And now they have occupied, supposedly, the West Bank and have a indigenous people as their inferiors, something that is, of course, uh, repulsive and unacceptable in the Muslim world, that Jews would be in control. So I wanted to share with you a few slides to show you some of the common themes that, that repeat themselves and what people who are in ZOA and other organizations that are fighting this battle are up against. So part of the success of the pro-Palestinians of the anti-Israel forces, which is really what it is, people that profess to be anti-pro-Palestinian and by definition are actually anti-Israel. They're anti-Semitic often, but they're definitely anti-Israel. They don't seem to actually care about the well-being of the Palestinians, nor do any of the Arab nations that could have taken in those millions of refugees that have been left to languish and used as a ideological club against Israel since the founding of Israel in 48. This is a poster for Israel, Israeli Apartheid Week, which happens in March every year on campuses around the world now. But I think in many ways it defines the way that Israel is perceived and in specifically in contrast to the Arabs and the Arab world. So Israel here, as it often is, which you'll see in subsequent slides, is depicted as militaristic, mechanical, not even human. It's just a Apache helicopter. And the Arabs, as they are typically depicted, and you'll see this again in several of the other slides, are depicted as an innocent child carrying a teddy bear surrounded by what looks like a prison wall. And so this resurrects the Christian blood libel from the Middle Ages, which, which positioned Jews as the murderers of Gentile children. And the same trope is being used in accusing Israel today that Israel randomly, wantonly, and maliciously murders Arab children for their desire for more land and more power or whatever the apartheid regime of Israel uh, is seeking. So here you see a trope that is repeated as I quite frequently with the idea that the Palestinian Arab, as depicted by the child here, is always innocent. They're, they're not strapping explosives on themselves. They're not trying to stab innocent civilians to death in Jerusalem. They're not ramming people with their cars. And they're not shooting rockets into civilian towns in southern Israel to kill Jews, not soldiers, Jews. So Israel here is not even a person. It has no humanity. It's rapacious, it's murderous, and it's cruel and militaristic. So there's a, as Sharona mentioned, I teach marketing. And in marketing, branding is an important concept. There's actually a English guy, Simon Anhalt, who does branding evaluations of countries. In other words, how favorable are people's perceptions of particular countries? Why is this important? Because countries uh, kind of compete for businesses to come settle there. They compete for tourists to come to see them. They, they want to be looked at favorably. And so this nat National Brand Index was done. And as you see, more than 25,000 people were surveyed. And they were asked to rank a various list of countries based on the percep perception of whether they would like to live there and what type of a culture it is and what type of people they would be living with. And remarkably, 
Israel, which has a Western style of, of life. It has the second most venture capital companies of anywhere except the United States. It has a free and open democracy, a free press, uh, human and civil rights for all of its citizens, including its non-Jewish, Christian, and Muslim citizens that comprise 20% of, of the nation. And yet Israel always appears in these brand index surveys at the bottom of the list, below North Korea and Yemen and Saudi Arabia and countries that have dismal human rights records and that treat their citizens their own citizens with disdain and subjugation. So this is a remarkable thing. Why did this happen? So in branding, there's a concept called brand hijacking. And the guy that came up with this theory said that in companies where there's um, consumers who buy the products, such as Apple computers or JetBlue or Harley Davidson or Doc Martin boots or Barbie dolls. When a product is loved by its, by its consumers, that the consumers hijack the brand and they go out and promote it and tell their friends and everyone that they know how great the product is. This is a very beneficial thing for a company to have its brand hijacked by the people that love the brand. However, I've proposed that, that a brand can be hijacked by the competitors or enemies of the brand. And this is what's happened in Israel's case. So that the narrative that has been created by the pro-Palestinian folks is completely the opposite. It is the world turned upside down when it comes to Israel. So here is three examples of how Israel brands itself. This, the, the, Centerfold on the left was Maxim Magazine, which wanted to appeal to young men and give them a favorable view of Israel. So that they had women from the IDF posing in provocative poses. And the others are just showing that Israel is, is a place of great history, but also a contemporary place like Miami Beach with, with nightlife and, and, and all of the other features of a progressive, beautiful country. However, the brand has been hijacked. And this is the brand image that it's obvious that many people who participated in that brand survey have of Israel. That top billboard was, uh, is a campaign saying stop the 30 billion, which is the amount of military aid we would give Israel over 10 years. But you see what the message is, tell Congress, stop killing children. Well, what's often forgotten is the reason that there is sometimes, even though is the IDF is scrupulously careful about avoiding collateral damage when, it's, when it has to go in to Gaza to repress rocket fire that's threatening its own citizens, even though it, it takes great care not to harm civilians and to only neutralize terrorists, the fact is that Hamas has a reputation and always uses children and civilians as human shields. And they fire their missiles into Israel from civilian neighborhoods, from mosques and churches and hospitals. So the, I, so the, the reality is that children do become collateral damage when Israel tries to protect its own citizenry. But that's the fault of Hamas, not the fault of Israel. But here, the, the two images on the right Again, we have a child, not a, not a man who is a terrorist, who has, who's a member of Hamas, which has in its covenant that their duty is to murder Jews wherever they find them, not just Israelis, to murder Jews wherever they are. This is the duty from Allah. So here you have another depiction of Israel as a tank. There's no, there's no human element to that and you have an innocent Arab child with only a stone going against the murderous power and the military might of Israel. So this is, this is closer to how Israel is depicted on campuses today. This is the narrative that is being promoted. 
Erwin Cutler is a colleague of mine who was a member of parliament in Canada and then founded the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights in Canada. He's a wonderful, compassionate man. And he, he has this quote, which I think really focuses on what the issue is with the hatred of Israel on campuses now and what we're up against. So his contention was in the 20th century, the worst thing that you could be accused of was being a racist, that racism was the scourge of society in civilized countries. And where did racism manifest itself most profoundly? In Nazism and in apartheid in South Africa. And isn't it interesting that the two labels promiscuously applied to Israel are that they are the new Nazis and that Israel is an apartheid regime. So on university campuses, racism is the third rail of the student's existence. And if you're perceived to be a racist, if Zionism has now been equated with being a racist ideology, then if you even support Israel, if you even question those who are supposedly pro-Palestinian and who are attacking Israel, you are perceived to be a racist. And that's about the worst possible position you can have on the hierarchy on university campuses today, where students who are well-meaning but naive are trying to create a closed world where everybody loves each other and there is no bad thoughts, no hate speech. The problem with this is that only victims can be perceived as being bigoted against. And Jews now have become white. Jews on campuses now are, are perceived as being able to be protected by white privilege. And that if they stand up for Israel, they are racist and they are not progressive. And in fact, what we've seen, and Carrie Nelson in his wonderful book, Israel Denial, mentioned this many times, that now Zionists are being excluded from progressive causes because they are seen to be in opposition to what progressives think that they represent, which is everybody loving each other, caring for the victim, and breaking the world into oppressor and victim. And when it comes to victim and oppressor, Israel is always on the oppressor side, and the Palestinians are always on the oppressed side, the victim side. So the Palestinians have become the favorite third world victim that the blacks in South Africa used to occupy in the minds of activists during the 80s. The other problem from the faculty perspective is, and, and why this is important is for two reasons. One is that faculty at universities frequently have to be the sponsors of student groups like Students for Justice in Palestine, which is the principal instrument that's used on campuses to attack Israel. But also they, they write books and they teach courses in Middle Eastern studies departments. And even though you can tell from the last election, for example, that the, the divide in society is about 50-50 Democrat, liberal, and Republican conservative. But on university campuses, you see that, that in the departments of social sciences, anthropology, English literature, history, the ratio of self-defined liberals to conservatives is 30 to one. Sometimes it's at the lower in history, 9.5 9 to 1. Philosophy, 13.5 to 1. Sociology, 28 to 1. In other words, there's no conservative thoughts. Well, why is this important in our conversation tonight? Because liberals tend 
to be pro-Palestinian on university campuses if they care about that particular cause. They, they tend to see Israel as a colonial oppressor, as someone who has stolen someone else's land and artificially set up a state there and who continues to oppress the victim Arabs who supposedly have lived there from time immemorial. So the problem of a disparity in political slant seeps down into the classroom. It seeps down into the writing and the books that are produced by these professors. And it helps liberal thought gain traction on university campuses. Students for Justice in Palestine is the principal driver of anti-Israel sentiment on university campuses. They have around 200 chapters. They call themselves pro-Palestinian, but as I mentioned before, by definition, they are not pro-Palestinian. They do nothing for the Palestinians. They don't try to get the Palestinians to the negotiating tables. They don't tell the Palestinians to, to end the incitement uh, for violence and terrorism. They don't tell them to not make heroes out of people that kill Jews and name town squares after them. They do nothing for the Palestinians in a way that would help them actually realize a state and to create some cohesive political structure which would enable them to move forward instead of languishing with this hatred. Uh, so students for justice in Palestine have become dangerous because they are like the brown shirts. And even though they decry Israelis as being fascistic and repressive, they themselves are because they not only have a policy of not allowing any Zionistic dialogue to go on on campuses between them and pro-Israel folks. But when pr people come on campuses, guest speakers, to speak for Israel, in support of Israel, they have famously and notoriously interrupted those speeches, shouted them down, gone to the deans and say, don't let this person speak, he's an Islamophobe. And they've done it not only in a, in a polite way, but in a way that police had to be called to escort some of these speakers off campuses. And the APCA initiative, which I serve on the board with, Tammy Benjamin and Leela Beckwith, the founders, noticed that when SJP is on a campus and they have an, a BDS campaign, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanction campaign, that that, re that results in more anti-Semitic, anti-Zionistic and anti-Israel acts and acts of violence and intimidation and harassment on those campuses. It's amazing that this group is allowed to continue to exist on campuses and actually Fordham University took a very bold and, uh, and unusual step this, this last year in not approving the Student for Justice in Palestine chapter that wanted to exist and they were taken to court and they lost the court case because the court found that you couldn't exclude them based on what they were going to speak about because that violated their First Amendment rights. What they should have done is said that the reason they don't want them on campus is because of their behavior, not because of their speech. So I think in the future, groups that are fighting for Israel and want to protect students from the harassment that they get from SJP will, will go after their behavior because they frequently violate the rules that all universities have. It's, it's unacceptable, for example, to interrupt a speaker and to cause a speech to be canceled and to, and to say in advance, as SJP has in, their, in a revealed memo that we found from Binghamton University, they said, we are not going to have any dialogue with anyone on campuses that's pro-Israel. 
Well, that violates what the spirit of the university is about and what universities stand for. So this is a one minute clip, but I think it, I think it, ex it exhibits many of the points that I've been mentioning here. And I wanted you to, to read the signs and listen to the chants and then, and then we'll discuss them. I want to be known that we here in Berkeley support the Antifada. Antifada, Antifada, we support the Antifada. Antifada, we support the Antifada. Antifada, Antifada. Antifada, Antifada, we support the Antifada. Antifada, Antifada, we support the Antifada. Antifada, Antifada, we support the Antifada. Let the people of Palestine hear you. Free Palestine. Free 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 free Palestine. So I find this to be one of the most horrific aspects of anti-Israel activism. Imagine if you would, that this could never happen on a university campus, but if the KKK had a student chapter or the Aryan Brotherhood, a white supremacist group had a university chapter and they were chanting, send them back to Africa, string them up, string them up, string them up. What would the reaction of the university be? The, the chapter would be thrown off campus immediately, as, as have fraternities when they've made anti-Black jokes off campus that were recorded in private settings. Here's a guy yelling, Intifada, Intifada, long live Intifada. What does that mean? It means the Intifada was in 2000, the first Intifada, when thousands of Israelis were killed and injured in terroristic acts. And here are supposedly progressive, well-meaning, sensitive students who care about the Palestinians so much that they're telling their peers and people back in the West Bank and in Gaza to murder Jews, as if that's acceptable. And they're not doing it in, you know, you see how angry there is. There also was a sign that said Zionism is racism. Well, that's not what it is, but this conversation about apartheid and Zionism being racism is manifested in that, in that separation barrier that Israel has constructed. Why did they build that wall, that's, that barrier? To prevent terroristic attacks on the civilian population. And in fact, it was successful in reducing civilian attacks by 80%. But the International Criminal Court called the wall illegal. And its enemies who, like these kids on campus who build a mock apartheid wall, call it an apartheid wall, as if it was some kind of a segregation barrier to keep white Jews on one side and brown Arabs on the other side. There's nothing racial about the conflict in the Middle East between the Arabs and, and the Jews. And many Israeli Jews and Israelis are dark and, or darker than Arabs are. So this is not about race, but it fits conveniently into the, the false narrative that's been created on campuses. The other idea is Palestine should be free from the river to the sea. What does that mean? From the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. That encompasses all of what is now present day Israel, not just the West Bank and Gaza, but also present day Israel. So this is also based on the a, a false belief that there was a country called Palestine that is now occupied. And those people who believe that there was a country called Palestine 
which was a Muslim country, and that it is now occupied, are not talking about an occupation that is only in the West Bank. They're talking about an occupation that includes Tiberias and Tel Aviv and Haifa, that all of Israel proper and the West Bank and Gaza is occupied Muslim land, that, is, that there was a fictitious nation called Palestine, which Israel stole. So this idea that because there was a country called Palestine that is now occupied by Jews, that it's somehow acceptable to call for the murder of those Jews for Palestinian self-affirmation, not only is kind of murderous and grotesque in and of itself, but it also shows you that no one has any regard for Jewish self-determination, which is what Zionism is and what caused the creation of Israel in the first place. But I, I wanted to show you that chanting and those signs and this language to make you understand that this is, this is not a nuanced discussion as college administrators like to pretend it is about, you know, well, should the border be over here or should the border be over there? No, it's about getting rid of Israel. It's about freeing Palestine finally by extirpating Israel, by dissolving it. And one of the components, of course, of the BDS movement is the right of return of the five to seven million Palestinian refugees into what is now Israel, which would completely subsume the Jewish character of Israel. You know, since World War II, there's been about 100 million refugees from famines and wars and different causes. All of those refugees have been resettled or gone into other countries, and none of them remain except for one group of refugees, the Palestinians. And that, that's specifically used as a tool against Israel because no Arab nation would let them be resettled with the hopes that eventually they're going to be pushed back into Israel. And also the Palestinian refugees are the only refugees who have been considered a refugee when they're the child or grandchild of the original refugee. There was only between four and 600,000 original Palestinian refugees in 1948. Now there's five to seven million. How did that happen? Because they count all of their descendants, which has never been done for any other group. Richard, we have we have more time. It's 740. So, you know, if we want to just giving you a, a note about. All right, well, why don't we. You can, you, do you want to go on for a couple more minutes before we take questions? This, it's, this is so engaging, so I just wanted to give you a heads up about the time. All right, I'll, we, can, we can see. So uh, I was talking earlier about the faculty and their influence and these are two books that are indicative of some of the, the ways that faculty has gone wrong. The Israel Lobby came out a number of years ago, at least 10 years ago now. Uh, it, Alan Dershowitz and others, including me, uh, wrote extensively about it. And in fact, Alan did a white paper immediately when this book first came out in a shortened version. And it basically is an updated version of the Protocols of the Elder of Zion because Walt and Mearsheimer uh, were wondering out loud why, in their view, America had been suffering as a result, Where are you of, going? As a result of its support of Israel. And they wondered why. And they said, well, there's no reason we should be supporting Israel. So the only reason they're, they're there is that we are supporting Israel is that there's this nefarious, underhanded, powerful lobby with a stranglehold on Congress that's making America do things that are not in its self-interest but are in the interest of, of Israel. Well, this is, this is another libel that Jews work behind the scenes to control nations and that they use their power 
and their influence to gain wealth or power or win wars or, or whatever it is that Jews at that moment are being accused of. Um, the book, the book was a bestseller, even though they claimed that the Jewish lobby was so powerful that they were going to repress any criticism of it, which was sort of ironic. Why this book was dangerous is that it was not written by some crank in the blogosphere. It was written by Mearsheimer from University of Chicago and Stephen Wall from the Kennedy School at Harvard, Ivy League universities that had credibility, which gave the book some credibility even though it was a retelling of some anti-Semitic tropes. Facts on the Ground was written by Nadia Abu el Haj, who wrote this as a master's thesis and then got tenure at, at Barnard. She's a pro-Palestinian advocate. She admits this in the beginning of the book. She's not an archeologist. And her contention and premise in this book was that Jews really had no connection to the Holy Land or Jerusalem and, and the whole area of what is now Israel. That, that sneaky, underhanded Jewish archaeologists had sort of looked for a historical connection to the land and had falsely created it. And so this book, which got her tenure at another Ivy League school at Barnard, uh, was, made, was a fiction developed by somebody from a reputable university and given credence by a publisher who published it. Um. Okay, can we go to, can we go to questions? Absolutely. Okay, Richard, thank you so much. Um, very, very enlightening and frightening, of course. Um, and also so important how you shared all of the different prongs from on the campus, on the ground, from student groups, through, uh, through, acad through acad academia and the academic department, and that this is a multi-pronged issue. There are a lot of questions, and we'll get through as many as we can. And again, the, you click the chat on the, on the bottom of the screen, and you type in your question. So we'll start with this. Why has the American Jewish experiences on campus above all failed to awaken Jewish leadership to what needs to be addressed and the fact that as bad as anti-Semitism is on the right, nothing comes close to political power on the left, which totally dominates academia, shutting down all discussions regarding threats coming from Muslim Brotherhood front groups especially on campus. And I think the, the Muslim Brother, Brotherhood front group, the, an example of that is the Muslim Student Association, which was founded by the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, well, one problem for Jewish students on campuses is, as I think I mentioned, administrators don't perceive them to be a marginalized group. They don't perceive them to be a, in a victim group in the same way that they do for their gay students and their Muslim students and their Hispanic students and certainly their black students. Jews are not considered to be at risk on a university campus. And as I told you, there's been increasing emphasis by anti-Israel people to, to make Jews seem to be white people that are enjoying white privilege. And so they're not lumped in with victim groups. The other problem for administrators and why it's very difficult to get a university to respond in a way that seems responsible and fair is that they're terrified at the idea of harming or insulting or seeming to be intolerant of those marginalized groups of students and they don't fear any repercussions from Jewish students. We've tried to change this. So one problem with certain larger Jewish organizations like the Anti-Defamation League is that the Anti-Defamation League has decided that the main source of anti-Semitism isn't coming from the Muslim world or from leftist professors and students. It's coming from white supremacist groups. Well, that's ridiculous. There could be some hatred of Jews by white supremacists, 
but white supremacists are totally invisible on university campuses. They have no, no presence at all. And sometimes a flyer will be dropped around a campus or somebody will put up a swastika, but that's about it. There's certainly no Nazi professors. There's no white power professors. There's no white power student groups. So the idea that the ADL has decided that that's the principal source of anti-Semitism that we have to worry about in, in today's world is possibly an ideological problem with the ADL and their current leadership. But groups like Scholars for Peace in the Middle East, which deals with faculty, and the Brandeis Center, which, which and the Lawfare Project by Brooke Goldstein, which attacks legally some of these universities that don't do the right thing and protect the Jewish students have been taking a more proactive and assertive position to make administrators face the reality that they're allowing a hostile climate on campuses. And I know ZOA has been very active in this too. And if you'd like Susan to describe what you folks have done specifically, I think that might be an appropriate segue. Are you able, you want to unmute yourself, Susan? You're still muted. There you go. Can everybody there you go. Yes. Great, great. Thank you, Richard. I so enjoyed your presentation and um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the work that ZOA has been doing for many years now. Um, just a few of the highlights. Um, ZOA was the organization that filed the first civil rights action on behalf of Jewish students under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act to address anti-Semitism that students were experiencing at UC Irvine. This was the first case of campus anti-Semitism that the government ever agreed to investigate under Title VI. Um, we filed a Title VI action against Rutgers University, which led the federal government to issue a policy that uh, in effect adopted the State Department definition of anti-Semitism, um, which happens to be an excellent definition. Um, it recognizes the traditional forms of anti-Semitism, but also recognizes that some anti-Zionist and anti-Israel sentiment crosses the line into anti-Semitism. So this, this was a definition that we've been begging the government to use for many, many years. And as a result of the ZOA's case against Rutgers, um, the Office for Civil Rights decided to use this definition when it considers and decides uh, Title VI actions alleging anti-Semitism. And we have helped students, not just the Center for Law and Justice, but our wonderful campus department. We have been working with students fighting anti-Semitism really across the country, um, not just at Irvine. We help students at Berkeley. We've helped students at Northeastern University, uh, at uh, University of Michigan. We're working with students at Duke University currently, um, and we've worked with students at the CUNY schools um, and really were, I'm proud to say, triggered the major legal developments in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Susan. And I would also like to uh, address it, address the, the question of awakening Jewish leadership from my own personal experience because it was my experience as a student on campus that brought me into a career with, with ZOA. I was very active when I was a student and there are a lot of organizations that work with students on campuses. Um, and I worked in, with a lot of them and I got to know a lot of them and I was familiar with a lot of them, but it was ZOA's support and guidance was really unparalleled. And, and, I, and so ZOA is definitely awakened and this is so much of what we do. And I said to myself when I graduated, if I was gonna work for a Jewish or Zionist organization, it would be ZOA because I would be very proud to be a part of an organization to, um, 
to be so unapologetic and to give this kind of support to students. And I started in the campus department, and it's been so rewarding to see how this department has grown in our, with our current leadership with Jonathan, who is on this call. Um, and 13 years later, I'm still very proud to say I feel the same way. We have next questions. We have a bunch of questions along this line, so I'm kind of um, combining them. And as a, a branding expert, the questions about flipping the branding and how we should describe the facts and doctrines of our enemies. Specifically, um, an example during Israel, Israel, Israel apartheid weeks, the suggestion in question is to for students to put up their own walls with accurate facts or balloons and kites with on the campus lawns with notes attached with data and facts and information and what your thoughts are on that, um, Richard. And, and I also, um, I want to hear your answer to that. And then I would also want to hear from our campus director after Jonathan afterwards. This has been a, a huge problem because the way that the pro-Palestinian campus groups do their events and Israeli Apartheid Week and, and other types of special events and productions is effective because it makes for good theater. The problem is much of it is distorted, taken completely out of context, doesn't reflect history or fact, and make some erroneous assumptions like the existence of a place called Palestine, which is sort of fundamental. When Jewish kids have a pro-Israel event, they typically, you know, eat hummus and sing folk songs, and they don't take an aggressive anti-Palestinian stance in a way that's engaging or effective. I'm not sure that Jewish students who are pro-Israel want to get into a fighting match with them, but I had thought, and David Horowitz at the David Horowitz Freedom Center had tried a version of this to come up with something called Palestinian Terrorism Week, where you show the reality of what the, the Palestinian movement stands for, what they commit, you know, how they operate, how they inculcate their children from kindergarten to be shaheeds, martyrs, to murder Jews, and to not recognize the even the existence of the Jewish state, let alone the viability of it or the legitimacy of it. So that, of course, would, would draw an enormous amount of backlash if you took that anti-Palestinian approach, unfortunately, because you would be accused of being Islamophobic, just as David Horowitz has when he's put posters of SJP members to show that their relationship and their connections to terrorist groups or some of the tweets where they advocate for the murder of Jews or make jokes about the Holocaust or praise Hitler. So this is not just, we call this the new anti-Semitism, that this hatred of Israel is not just about Israel. Nobody cares that much about the Palestinians. What they care about is a convenient and safe way to hate Jews that you can hate the Jewish state in st because anti-Semitism in its rawest form loss is out of fashion in polite society, at least, in most of polite society, not, not completely, obviously, if you look at some of the government officials in Britain and elsewhere, and even in our US Congress with some of our newly elected Congresswomen. We can hear you, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, thank you for this presentation, and thanks, Sharona. Um, just to formally introduce uh, myself, my name is Jonathan Ginsberg. I'm the Managing Director of ZOA's Campus Department. Um, I'm based in Boston. We also have um, two of our other members, Or Taylor and Marlene Artov, also on this call um, from our department, who do amazing work in supporting students on behalf of ZOA. So there's a lot to unpack. I had a chance to, to see many of the questions and comments. Um, but I do just want to say, uh, clearly this is an uphill battle for uh, the entire Perezor community, but the most important um, aspect of our job is to really educate, 
and empower students, uh, both Jewish students and non-Jewish students as well, who are supportive of Israel and those who could potentially um, come into our camp. So really it's all based on outreach, but just going back a little bit, um, generally around this time of year, as you know, Israel apartheid weeks are uh, rampant on campus and it's really one of the most difficult times. And it's tough for us because we need to balance not just being entirely reactionary, but still ensuring that we have as robust and as strong of a presence as possible. And you know, one thing that we've realized is that this younger generation, they have such kind of little knowledge when it comes, you know, it's our job to uh, you know, impress these things upon them. But when it comes to, for example, what happened during the second intifada and the reasons why Israel has a security um, barrier in place, um, you know, it's almost like you know, we do have to start from scratch. Um, and it's difficult because we want to make sure that they know the facts, but more importantly, they understand how to effectively share our story. And I think that's one thing where we do see the other, the other side um, succeeding. They understand how, that they, how to go about intersectionally reaching a wider audience. And for us, um, we're also doing that in a different way. We bring in um, many different expert speakers from various communities in Israel, whether it's um, people from the LGBTQ community, um, Arab Israelis who are Zionists, Ethiopians, um, to share their perspectives of growing up in Israel and what it's like um, to, to support Israel and also uh, defend Israel. I myself was a former soldier, uh, one soldier in the IDF when I was younger, and um, it's, a, it's a big part of uh, my identity and I think for all of us as defenders of Israel, um, there's so many ways that we uh, stand up and, and support. So uh, if we do have more questions, uh, at some point we'll also be hosting a separate ZOA campus uh, to, to focus on more pertinent issues. But um, really, thank you again. Um, and if you have other questions, feel free to let us know. Thank you, Jonathan. There are a lot of questions here, so I'm sure that a lot of these questions will spill over into your program. Um, but since it's, it's eight o'clock, I just wanna thank, thank you, Susan and Jonathan for, for weighing in. And thank you again, Richard, for your presentation and spending your evening with us. I'd like to expand on what Susan discussed earlier about ZOA's Center for Law and Justice, because under Stu Susan's leadership, the center is at the forefront of fighting against campus anti-Semitism. It is ZOA that led the way in getting Title VI amended to include protections for Jewish students, and thank God we were successful in achieving this. It's because of Susan's tireless work. It was and continues to be a tremendous achievement because Title VI is used and it served as a stepping stone to President Trump's executive or order enforcing protections of Jews on campus when they are discriminated against based on their ethnicity. ZOA also has its boots on the ground with our, with our campus department directed by Jonathan Ginsburg. ZOA's campus department is active in over 40 states and at most major universities, educating students and inspiring pride in Zionism. This is done through the ZOA Campus Fellowship and with its student leadership mission to Israel, which runs two trips a year, bringing over 60 students to visit communities in Judea and Samaria, which other trips do not do. The students meet with members of Knesset and journalists and Middle East analysts and much, much more. If you are aware of anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism issues on campus, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at ZOA, the email address info at ZOA, Dot org. Again, it's info at zoa.org. Before we end the program, I want to reiterate that we at ZOA are a dedicated group, as you can see, and I am really so proud of this organization. And, you know, one of the questions was about um, strategies and how do we win this war? And this is, this is a war that, that make no mistake, everybody has a role in. And the reality of this pandemic is that the donations that we are receiving are not where they were last year at this time. So I'm hoping that we can count on you. Don't underestimate the, the value and what we can do and what we can expand on and how much more we can do with your support. We will come out at the other end of this pandemic stronger than our enemies. I know we will. 
but I want you to be a part of making that happen. So please support us financially as much as you can. We need you. And on that end, please consider joining ZOA's Donor Society. Being part of our Donor Society gives you access to exclusive briefings and opportunities with elected officials, Knesset members, members of the White House, ambassadors, and others. Lately, this has been virtual, but it's in-person and virtual. Arguably, though, the bigger benefit is how much more of an impact you have in expanding our crucial work. Membership to our Donor Society starts at a $1,000 donation or pledge for a calendar year and can be made in installments throughout the year. To learn more, please visit our website, zoa.org, or email me at florida at zoa.org. I will end by telling you about our upcoming virtual programs. Tuesday, next week, Tuesday at 11 a.m., Greater, Greater Philadelphia ZOA presents the Relationship Between Jewish Observance and Zionism, featuring Naftali Pearlberger. Wednesday at 7 p.m., ZOA's kickoff event for its Young Professionals Group, Beyond Netflix, examining legendary Israeli spy Ellie Cohen, featuring Golan resident and IDF major Yaakov Selavan. Thursday at 3 p.m., The Future of Jerusalem, the current tourism outlook and the status of building in Eastern Jerusalem featuring ZOA National President Morton Klein and Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Dlor Hassan Nahum. You can follow all of this and make sure you don't miss any of the programs by emailing on social media for details or emailing info at zoa.org to sign up. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Richard, again, and this will end the program for tonight.